Chapter 18 looks at the blood. So blood is the fluid connective tissue that flows throughout the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system is composed of the heart and the blood vessels. Um, the blood itself is made up of the liquid portion, which is plasma, and then the cellular portion, which are your erythrocytes, or your red blood cells, your leukocytes, or your white blood cells, and then platelets, which are cellular fragments important for uh, blood clotting. We've got three types of vessels, arteries, veins, and capillaries. Arteries are the vessels that carry the blood away from the heart. Uh, veins are the vessels that carry the blood back towards the heart. And the capillaries are the small vessels that lie in between the arteries and the veins. And these are important because this is where gas exchange happens. So when I talk about gas exchange, I'm talking about releasing oxygen to the, from the blood to the tissues and then picking up carbon dioxide. So our cells and our tissues need oxygen to do all of their metabolic activities. Um, whenever they do those, they end up producing waste products such as carbon dioxide, and we've got to get rid of that. So um, the blood allows us to deliver oxygen to tissues and pick up waste products, um, which will eventually come back to the lungs and so we can exhale it. So this is some newly oxygenated blood. Um, you can tell because it's red in the diagram, just came from the lungs, the heart will pump it away, and the, this particular diagram, it's showing it, you can either go up towards the head or down to the body, so you just pick one of those routes. So you're in an artery right now, and then it's going to get into a capillary bed. You can see the capillary bed is very small vessels, and you can see it change from red to blue. That's because we're delivering oxygen, we're getting rid of that oxygen, taking it to our cells and our tissues, and we're picking up carbon dioxide. So as it exits the capillary bed, it's now in a vein. So veins are what? They're the vessels that bring the blood back towards the heart. So here's the blue, blue indicating that it's deoxygenated. Um, so it comes back into the heart. The heart will pump that out towards the lung. So this is showing you the capillary. Here's the lung that I'm outlining. This is showing you the capillaries in the lungs. And as we breathe and that blood moves through the lungs, that oxygen in the air gets into that blood and that's why you see it go back from blue to red. So now we've got newly oxygenated blood, comes back to the heart and then we can do that whole process again. Some of the functions of blood, transportation, it carries oxygen from the lungs to the cells of the body and it uh, carries carbon dioxide or CO2 from the cells of the body back to the lungs. So that again is gas exchange. It carries nutrients and drugs um, that have been absorbed across the GI tract. So when you eat a meal and you digest it into its smallest part, it gets absorbed into the bloodstream. And then we can transport it to the different cells in the body that need the, those nutrient molecules and the drugs. It also carries hormones from the secretory glands to the target tissue. So we saw that in the endocrine system. Uh, regulation, it regulates body temperature by absorbing heat as it flows through the skeletal muscle tissue and then releasing that heat as it flows through the dermal tissue. Uh, so this is one reason why your skin might have a redder or darker appearance uh, whenever you're hot because uh, we can release some of that heat from the body as it flows through uh, the blood vessels lying underneath the skin. So it gives your skin a, a little bit of a redder tone. Um, regulates body pH by absorbing acids and bases from cells. Um, because the blood contains buffers, the pH of the blood is not really affected largely by this. Um, so other uh, areas in the body may not have those buffers, so if they take on too many acids, their pH will start to decrease. So they can release those acids into the blood where there are buffers, so the blood can take on those acids without having major pH changes. Uh, regulates fluid balance by exchanging fluids as needed between the blood and the cells slash interstitial fluid. So the interstitial fluid is just the fluid that kind of bathes our cells or the fluid that kind of surrounds our cells. Um, and we can exchange things, uh, nutrient molecules, ions, things like that between the cells and the blood and then that interstitial fluid which kind of lies between the cells and the blood. So all of the things discussed in here, we will talk about in detail at some point. Um, 
but this just kind of gives you an overall idea of some of the regulatory functions of blood. And then protection, because one of the cellular components of blood is leukocytes. Leukocytes are a white blood cell, um, and they are an important component of our immune system that protect our body against infection. Physical characteristics of blood. So we've got the color. Um, it's always red, just depending on uh, the oxygen state will determine whether it's kind of this scarlet red or a darker red. So oxygen rich is a very bright scarlet red. Oxygen poor is a darker red. For the volume, it's about four to five liters for females and five to six liters for males. So if you want to just kind of remember in general, five liters and know that, you know, females can be more towards four, males can be more towards six. The viscosity, which is kind of your thickness, is four to five to five and a half times thicker um, than water. So we're talking about whole blood here. It's about roughly five times thicker uh, than water. Temperature, about 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And the pH, notice this very specific range. It's, it has to be between 7.35 and 7.45. Um, we've got buffers to maintain it in that range, but if for any reason pH of the blood varies outside of this range for very long at all, it can become fatal very quickly. A blood smear is what you have if you take a blood sample and put it on a slide and look at it under the microscope. So that would be a blood smear and it would look something similar to this. So you'll see a bunch of these, what I describe as kind of pink donut looking things. Those are your erythrocytes. Your erythrocytes are your red blood cells. That's what you're gonna have the most of. It's the most numerous cell type, and it appears as a pink or a light purple anucleated cell. So anucleated meaning it doesn't have a nucleus. The leukocytes are these larger cells that have the purple staining nucleus. Notice that these, they all look kind of similar. They look different than your red blood cells, but they don't look identical, do they? And that's because we have a variety of different type of, nu of leukocytes. Um, so these are gonna be fewer. You don't have as many leukocytes as you do erythrocytes, but they're larger cells. Clearly, it's a much bigger cell than you know, your erythrocyte. Um, and they have this purple staining nucleus. And then platelets are just fragments of cells. So you can see platelets over here, just little cellular fragments. So those are some of the things that you'll see in a blood smear. The composition of blood plasma. So remember I said blood plasma is the fluid or the liquid portion of blood. So you've got the fluid portion and then the cellular portion. Fluid is just the plasma. It's 92% water. So water serves as the solvent by which we're going to dissolve all the proteins and the ions in the blood. 7% of it is proteins. The proteins have important roles, um, one of which is to um, serve as a buffer um, so that we can maintain that blood pH between 7.35 and 7.45. Also to transport lipid soluble molecules. So we talked about um, how the lipid soluble or the steroid hormones um, or thyroid hormone, which was a biogenic amine, but happened to be lipid soluble. Those have to have carrier proteins to travel through the blood. So that's an example of a protein that you would find in the blood. Um, plasma proteins include albumin, that was a carrier protein, globulins, and fibrinogen that's involved in blood clotting. Those are just a couple of examples of proteins that you would find in the blood plasma. And then 1% of it is other solutes, your ions, your nutrients such as glucose, amino acids, cholesterol, things like that, and then some waste products, lactic acid, urea, all of those are cellular waste products. Hemopoiesis, sometimes referred to as hematopoiesis, is the process that we use to make what are called formed elements. So formed elements are erythrocytes, leukocytes, and platelets. Um, 
because these formed elements have such a short lifespan, we have to continually make more and replace them. Um, so erythropoiesis is the formation of red blood cells or erythrocytes. Leukopoiesis is the formation of white blood cells or leukocytes. And then thrombopoiesis is the formation of platelets. So this chart kind of shows you um, the production of different blood cell types. Um, I'm not asking you to commit this chart to memory by any means, but I wanted to kind of show you how you start with a stem cell that comes from the bone marrow, okay? Um, and then, depending on different factors, um, you can go down a process that will either take you through erythropoiesis, which you'll see this kind of changing cell type that will eventually lead to an erythrocyte. You can undergo the process of thrombopoiesis. Again, the cell is going to change, but in a different way than it did for erythropoiesis, and you're going to end up with platelets. Or you can um, do the same thing, have different cellular changes that are going to lead to your different leukocytes. The influencing factor that's going to depend on whether it goes to make red blood cells, platelets, or white blood cells um, are these different factors. So this EPO stands for erythropoietin, um, and so that's going to stimulate the production of erythrocytes. Here's thrombopoietin, that stimulates the production of thrombocytes or platelets. And then you've got different, uh, this GCSF, MCSF, these are colony stimulating factors, that's what the CSF stands for, and just depending on which ones are around, it's going to stimulate the production of various uh, leukocytes. Um, just so you have kind of a broad idea that you're starting with a stem cell that comes from the bone marrow, you've got all of these different factors that are going to be around, and depending on which factors are get involved, that's going to determine whether you get red blood cells, white blood cells, or platelets. So colony stimulating factors, I talked about those. Um, these are required for the maturation and the division of the hemopoietic stem cells in the formation of these formed elements. So it just kind of gives you the name of some of them um, and what they do. Multi-colony stimulating factor increases the formation of erythrocytes, some granulocytes and monocytes. We'll talk about these. These are leukocytes and we'll talk about them in a, in a little bit. Um, and platelets. These two down here we talked about, um, thrombopoietin stimulates the production of platelets, erythropoietin is going to stimulate the production of erythrocytes. So this kind of shows you the process of erythropoietin. Again, it's showing you the bone because we get a stem cell from our uh, bone marrow. So this is a multipotent hemopoietic stem cell. And what that means is it's a stem cell that comes from the bone marrow. Hema he well, in this case, it says hematopoietic, meaning that it will become some type of blood cell. And multipotent because at this point, we don't know which one it will be. So this basically, this particular cell could go on to become any type of blood cell. Then you have that multi-colony stimulating factor or multi-CSF kind of changes this to what's called a myeloid progenitor cell. This is a large nucleated cell. Um, it will evolve into what's called a pro-erythroblast or pro-normoblast. This is a smaller cell that starts to produce hemoglobin in its cytoplasm. Hemoglobin is an important protein for your red blood cells. Um, it evolves into this basophilic erythroblast, so the cell is just kind of shrinking, and then you have erythropoietin, or EPO, that was one of those kind of colony stimulating factors. Um, it develops into a polychromatic erythroblast, um, and then into a normal blast. So normal blast is a smaller cell, it has more hemoglobin in the cytoplasm, um, and then eventually you're going to get this enucleation. So here's your small cell, lots of hemoglobin. Here's your nucleus. That nucleus is going to pop out of the cell. Um, 
and then you have a polychromatic erythrocyte or what's known as a reticulocyte. Um, the reticulocyte has lost all of its organelles except for the, some ribosomes. So essentially when you get to the point of an erythrocyte, you have nothing more than a plasma membrane bag full of hemoglobin. So contrast that to a normal cell that's got your nucleus and all of your organelles. So in the process of going from this stem cell all the way down to an erythrocyte, what's happening is you first need to start making hemoglobin and then you lose your nucleus and your cell starts to shrink and you lose your organelles. You lose your ribosomes last because those are what you need to make the protein hemoglobin. Um, so by the time you get to a reticular site, you've lost all of your organelles, including your nucleus, except for some ribosomes that are continuing to produce hemoglobin. And then eventually you get to your mature erythrocyte. So erythrocytes make up more than 99% of the formed elements in the blood. Erythropoiesis, or the formation of those erythrocytes, require dietary iron, B vitamins, uh, folic acid and riboflavin, and then amino acids. The formation of a reticulocyte from a myeloid stem cell, so go back to that previous slide, from the formation, from the beginning to the reticulocyte, takes about five days. And then after that reticulocyte is formed, it goes into circulation, and a couple of days after entering the circulation, the remaining organelles degenerate until that cell is essentially that plasma membrane bag of hemoglobin that I described, and that is a mature erythrocyte. Erythrocytes are commonly called red blood cells. A lot of times in this lecture, you'll see them referred to as RBCs and for the lab. Just know that erythrocytes, red blood cells, RBCs, that is the same thing. Um, but these are not an actual cell, so you've heard me refer to it as a formed element. The reason it's not technically a cell um, is because they lack a nucleus and organelle. It's not a cell, it's not, well yeah, it's not a cell that can continue living because it would need a nucleus and organelles to do so. Um, so any, that's why the term formed element is more appropriate when referring to erythrocytes. The structure of an erythrocyte is described as a biconclave disc, meaning it's this kind of disc-like structure. It caves in on the top, and then if you were to flip it over, it also caves in on the bottom. That's So it's really thin right here, and that's why sometimes it almost looks like there's a hole. It almost has a donut-looking appearance because it's very thin in the middle relative to the outside. Um, they, these can stack up and form a line that's called a rouleau. Yeah. And so you can see that structure formation right here. This is important to their function. Um, they do this as they travel through the capillaries. The capillaries are very small, thin-walled vessels, and they're pretty delicate. So if you just have a whole bunch of uh, red blood cells that cluster and clump and then try to shove their way through here, it can cause damage to the capillary vessels. So they line up almost single file in this rouleau structure so that they can travel nicely through the capillaries. The function of erythrocytes is to transport oxygen and carbon dioxide, or CO2, between the lungs and the tissues. So delivering oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and then delivering CO2 from the tissues back to the lungs. They have a quote unquote lifespan of about 120 days. And that's because again, it's not technically a cell. It doesn't have a nucleus and it doesn't have organelles so it can't just continually live on. So it will last for about 120 days. Um, and then that's one reason why we're having to con continuously make more erythrocytes. So here's the leu leukopoiesis chart. Again, I'm not asking that you commit this chart to memory, um, but just kind of appreciate that you've got a cell, stem cell coming from the bone marrow. Um, down here, these are all the different types of leukocytes. And again, we're gonna go through all these in detail later. Um, but depending on the environment and the colony stimulating factors that are there influencing the process, uh, the cell will evolve to become 
one of these different types of leukocytes. So leukocytes make up less than 0.01% of the formed elements in the blood. It involves granulocyte maturation. Again, this is a term that we're, we'll get into in a little bit. Um, into eosinophils, basophils, and neutrophils. Those are three different types of leukocytes. You can see them down here. Um, and then monocytes maturation, and then lymphocyte maturation. Um, a band cell, uh, I, I think this term came up somewhere else. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Um, but a band cell is simply a cell uh, with a curved nucleus that's a result of granulocyte maturation. Um, so again, I put that in there because I think I remember a while back the term band cell was coming up and people were saying we never even talked about that. So I just kind of put that in there. So if you see band cell come up somewhere, you know what that is or kind of a description. If it doesn't pop up anywhere, then don't even worry about it. <clears throat> Thrombopoiesis is the production of platelets or thrombocytes uh, from megakaryocytes, which is cell type I'm about to describe. Um, so again, you start with a stem cell from the bone marrow. You've got all your colony stimulating factors, multi-CSF, thrombopoietin. Thrombopoietin is the one that's primarily, primarily going to lead to the production of platelets. And you um, see the evolution of the cell as it becomes uh, what's called a, me a megakaryocyte. Megakaryocyte is this really large cell with a multi-lobed nucleus. And then that's where we get our platelets from. Um, so the platelets form less than 1% of the formed elements in the blood. Um, you've got these megakaryocytes. So we go from a stem cell down to a megakaryocyte. Come over on this image and you can see the megakaryocyte kind of sitting on top of the blood vessel. And it produces these cellular extensions that are called proplatelets. You can see these little extensions off of the megakaryocyte going into the blood vessel. This is called a proplatelet. Um, it goes in between the endothelial cells. So anytime you see the term endothelial cells, it's just referring to the cells that line the blood vessel. Well, you have the blood flow coming through and as these a very fragile proplatelets are extending off of the megakaryocytes, the force of the blood going through kind of clips these little pieces off. And those little pieces are your platelets. So platelets are nothing more than just a cellular fragment being clipped off from part of this megakaryocyte. And so then it just goes and travels through the bloodstream. So hemoglobin came up before, hemoglobin is a protein within the erythrocytes, so you only find it within the red blood cells, and its job is to bind, and also importantly unbind, oxygen and carbon dioxide for transportation within the blood. Now, I bring that up, bind and unbind, because it does no good to bind oxygen and bind it so strongly that when it gets to where it needs to go, we can't deliver it, it can't unattach. So it's got to have just the right attraction, oxygen has to have just the right attraction to hemoglobin to be able to bind and be carried by it, and then when it gets where it needs to go, to come off and get delivered. So hemoglobin itself, again, it's a protein. Uh, it's made up of four smaller proteins called globins. So this is the structure of hemoglobin. Now, if you remember from 2401, um, you learned about protein structure. You had a primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. Now, not all proteins have a quaternary structure, uh, meaning that a protein can have up to a tertiary structure and then be complete. Um, but when you have multiple smaller proteins that come together to form a larger protein, that's its quaternary structure. And that's what you find here in hemoglobin. You have four smaller proteins that come together to make up one hemoglobin molecule. <clears throat> um, okay, so the four proteins are called globins. You have two alpha globins or alpha chains, one here and one here, and then two beta globins or beta chains shown here by the lighter colors. Each one of these globins contains a heme group. This little Saturn looking thing, this is a heme group. If you were to zoom it in, this is what it would look like. It has an iron right smack in the center of it 
and then all of this structure around it. I'm, you don't need to know all that molecular structure, um, but just know that you've got the four globin molecules, two alphas, and two betas, and each globin has a heme group. So there's four heme groups for every one hemoglobin. The heme group is important because that's where oxygen binds. Specifically, oxygen binds to the iron within the heme group. So oxygen is going to bind right here, um, and that's what's going to allow oxygen to attach to hemoglobin and be carried throughout the blood. Again, it binds somewhat weakly um, so that it can unbind when it gets to where it's going. Now, carbon dioxide, or CO2, binds to the globin molecule itself. So if I'm looking at this hemoglobin molecule, it's going to carry oxygen and carbon dioxide. Oxygen is going to bind to the heme group itself, specifically the iron within the heme group. So we can have one, two, three, four oxygens per one hemoglobin. Carbon dioxide is going to bind somewhere out here to the globin chain. It's not, it's not going to bind to the heme group. Carbon dioxide, again, binds somewhat weakly so that it can attach as it um, as the hemoglobin molecule goes through the tissues and then unattach as it travels through the lungs because for the CO2 it wants to hop off in the lungs so we can exhale it, get rid of it. Um, so this is actually um, talking about this weak attachment. This is how carbon monoxide poison happens because carbon monoxide has a very strong attachment uh, to hemoglobin. So if you're exposed to a bunch of carbon monoxide, it's going to saturate your hemoglobin molecules and it doesn't want to come off. So then when oxygen's around, you can't get the oxygen on because it's your heme groups are saturated, saturated with carbon monoxide. So it actually robs you of oxygen. That's just a little side note. <clears throat> okay, so oxygen blood, oxygenated blood appears bright red when hemoglobin is maximally loaded with oxygen. So when you have um, four oxygen molecules fully loaded onto your hemoglobin molecule, that's called oxygenated blood and it appears bright red. Deoxygenated blood appears dark uh, when once some of that oxygen is lost and carbon dioxide is gained. So once we, we start with four on here, when we lose some of that oxygen, we pick up CO2, we consider that deoxygenated blood and the color starts to appear darker and darker. Again, each hemoglobin molecule can bind four oxygen molecules at a time. Hemoglobin is loaded with oxygen as those erythrocytes pass through the capillaries in the lungs. So as our blood travels through our lungs while we inhale, we bring oxygen in through the air that we breathe in and we attach that to the hemoglobin that's in the blood traveling through the lungs at that time. Um, and then oxygen detaches from hemoglobin as, as it goes through um, the capillaries of the body tissues. So <clears throat> after it goes, after it gets oxygen in the lungs, that blood's gonna go back to the heart, the heart's gonna pump it out to our body tissues, and when it gets down to our body tissues, the oxygen will come off and go into our cells so our cells can use it for their metabolic processes. Erythropoietin is one of those um, factors that we talked about. In this case, it influences the production of red blood cells. It is also considered a hormone because it travels through the bloodstream. So this type of diagram should look familiar um, from kind of what we saw in the endocrine system. So we can start with the stimulus. The stimulus for erythropoietin release or EPO release is decreased blood oxygen levels. So when the blood oxygen levels start to decrease, You've got cells in the kidneys that detect that, and they in turn release erythropoietin, or EPO, into the blood. So EPO will stimulate the red bone marrow to increase the rate of production of erythrocytes. So we start to make more red blood cells. So now you have more red blood cells coming out into circulation, and the more red blood cells you have, the more oxygen you can carry. So increased number of erythrocytes means higher blood oxygen levels, and once those blood oxygen levels get back up to normal levels, then your kidney will stop producing erythropoietin. Erythrocyte volume disorder. So let's look at anemia. 
Anemia is a clinical condition described by a reduced capacity of the blood to carry oxygen, usually as a result of lower than normal erythrocyte percentage, so not enough red blood cells in the blood. Um, but it could also result from abnormal hemoglobin, impairing hemoglobin's ability to carry oxygen. So if the body tissues receive less oxygen from the blood, then what's going to happen is the heart's going to start to work harder and harder to deliver more blood and therefore more oxygen to those, to those tissues. So symptoms are going to be lethargy, kind of this feeling of tiredness, shortness of breath, pale skin, heart palpitations. Uh, treatment, it can be treated with pharmaceutical erythropoietin to allow the body to produce more erythrocytes. But a note down here, it's important for the clinician to verify that there's no underlying cause of chronic blood loss, um, such as a stomach ulcer or colon cancer that could be causing the problem. So you'd want to do like a thorough examination before you just give out EPO, because EPO can treat the problem if the problem is simply we're just not making enough. But if you're actually making enough, but you're losing blood, um, that, could, that could kind of present as anemia, but you'd be missing an important factor and it wouldn't do much good to just treat with erythropoietin at that point. Sickle cell disease, this happens with erythrocytes um, become sickle-shaped at lower blood oxygen level. Um, so, you know, in biology, in anatomy and physiology, structure is always related to function. And we talked about the structure of a red blood cell and it has, how it has that biconclave disc. And one of the important reasons for that structure is, if you remember, it forms what's called a rouleau. They stack up in a single file line, so as they go through the capillaries, they don't rupture the vessels. Well, in sickle cell disease, if blood oxygen levels get low, the structure of the red blood cells changes from this biconclave disc to this sickle-shaped structure. This is going to make it difficult for the red blood cells to pass through the blood vessels, um, and it can, it can cause uh, damage to the vessels and make the cells more prone to destruction um, and cause all kinds of problems. Okay, so let's get into the ABO blood types. Um, so as you probably know, you know everybody's got their specific blood type. Um, just as an example, you could be O positive or AB negative. So the ABO blood type refers to the first part of that, the actual letter portion. We'll get into the positive and negative here in a minute. But this is a, it's a method of blood typing. It's based on specific surface antigens that project from the plasma membrane of erythrocytes. So when I say surface antigen, I just mean it's a protein marker that sticks out from the plasma membrane of our red blood cells. So the purples and the blues, that's a surface antigen. Okay, so if an erythrocyte contains surface antigen A, the blood is considered to be type A. So here's a red blood cell. Here's the, the blue spheres, we're calling those surface antigen A. If it has A on its plasma membrane, it's called type A blood. If it has surface antigen B, it's considered B. So these little cones represent surface antigen B. So if those are present, then you've got type B blood. Now you can also have both. If your red blood cells have A and B on them, then your blood type is AB. And it could also have none of those. So if it doesn't have any of them, then your type O. Okay, so the letter is just telling you what antigen you have exposed on the plasma membrane of your red blood cells. A, B, A and B, or type O if you don't have any of them. Now, your body produces antibodies against whichever surface antigen you do not have on your red blood cells. So it needs, you need to make very certain that you have straight in your head the difference between an antigen and an antibody. So let me go through that. Antigen is the protein that is exposed on the surface of your red blood cells. 
Antibodies are proteins that travel through your bloodstream. They're not on your red blood cells. They're traveling freely. And you make antibodies against whichever antigens you do not have. So let's look at the chart and let's start with type A. This person is type A because they have surface antigen A on their red blood cells. So you make antibodies against the antigen you don't have. Does this person have type B? No, they have A. So they make antibodies against B. Why would they not make antibodies against A? Because antibodies attack a specific antigen. So if this person had anti a antibodies, which are antibodies that attack surface antigen A, their antibodies would be attacking their own red blood cells, and that would be a very bad thing. That's why we only make antibodies against the antigen that we do not have, okay? Okay, so let's look at surface antigen B, or, or type B. So type B has surface antigen B present on their uh, plasma membrane of their erythrocytes, so they make antibodies against a, because they don't have A. So you have antibodies against whichever antigen you do not have. Um, if they are type AB, they have surface antigens A and B. So which antibodies do they make? None. They don't make any antibodies. And then type O has neither A nor B. So which antibodies do they make? They make and anti-A and anti-B antibodies, okay? So if you need to kind of sit with that and wrap your brain around that for a minute, because um, it's very important that you kind of have clear the difference between the antigen, which is what's on your plus the red blood cells, and antibodies, and making antibodies against the antigens that we do not have. Okay, so let me see if I missed anything down here. Uh, your body recognizes surface antigens. Okay, yeah, so normally, uh, like when we're talking in general about antibodies in our immune system, their job is to help kind of bind to and attack foreign invaders. And that's kind of what these antibodies would do. Um, I, I did kind of already go through this, but like... Um, this anti-B antibody, if it sees the B antigen, it will attack it. Um, and so that's why we wouldn't have B antibodies in somebody that's type B. Um, so assuming there's nothing to attack, these antibodies are just kind of free floating throughout the body. Blood type compatibility for transfusions. So matching blood types have to be ascertained before a blood transfusion can be carried out. It, they do not have to be an exact match. They have to be compatible. We'll talk about compatibility in a minute. But the, um, the donor and the recipient, they have to have those compatible blood types to prevent what's called agglutination. Agglutination is clumping. Um, so let's look at uh, the chart. So agglutination is going to occur when antibodies against a surface antigen bind to that surface antigen on the red blood cell and cause clumping. Those clumps are going to block the blood vessels and prevent normal circulation and eventually result in the destruction of the red blood cells. Okay, so let's look at this chart. This top bar right here is compa shows compatibility. You have a type A blood donor so this is the donor blood. So this blood is going into, um, it, it's going into somebody else. The recipient is also type A. It says right here, type A blood of recipient. Okay. If the recipient, the person getting the blood is type A, you need to be able to tell me which antibodies they have. Do they have antibodies against A or B? Do they have antibodies against both, or do they not have any? Okay, so remember, we produce antibodies against the antigen that we do not have. So if the blood type, if this person is type A, that means they have the A antigen, which means they have the B antibody. Okay, so it says in parentheses, it contains anti-B antibodies. 
Okay. Well, the it's A blood going in. Remember, B had the, the cones just for visual purpose. So here's the anti-B antibody that would only bind to those cone or triangular shaped ones, but the blood coming in only had A. So there's nothing for the antibodies to bind. So no agglutination happens, no clumping happens. Now let's look down here, type A blood of donor. So here's that A blood again with the A surface antigen. But we're this time gonna put it in somebody that's a type B recipient. Okay, so ask yourself what type of antibodies does a type B person have? They have type A. They're, I'm sorry, they have antibodies against A, right? Because we make antibodies against the antigen that we don't have. So it tells you right here, it contains anti-A antibodies. Well, the blood that's coming in is type A. So see how it's got the spherical? This is an anti-A antibody and it's just ready to bind to a big old spherical antigen. So when you put that A blood in, the anti-A antibody binds to it and you can see it can bind multiple and it causes this clumping or agglutination effect. Okay, so on to the RH factor, which is otherwise known as surface antigen D. So remember when I said the positive and negative parts of our blood type is going to come back? This is, this is that coming back. So this is what determines whether you have a positive or a negative after your ABO blood type. So the RH blood type is determined by the presence or the absence of what's called the RH antigen, otherwise known as surface antigen D. Um, so this acts just like the A and B surface antigen, it's just surface antigen D. If the RH factor is present, uh, that person is said to be positive. If it's absent, then they're negative. So this is independent of your ABO blood type group. You're going to be either A positive or A negative, B positive or B negative, AB positive or AB negative, or O positive or O negative. And in all of those cases, the positive and negative just refers to whether you have the RH factor or surface antigen D. Those are the same things. If you have it, it's positive. If you don't have it, it's negative. RH antibodies appear in an RH individual who's been exposed to RH positive blood or an inappropriate blood transfusion. So again, if you if you have the RH factor or surface antigen D, you're not going to make any antibodies against it. If you don't have it, then you won't necessarily make antibodies against it unless you're already exposed to it, in which case you'll start to make antibodies against it. So RH incompatibility becomes important during pregnancy. Um, if you have an RH negative woman who conceives a child with an RH positive man, the fetus can either be RH positive or negative. So if the fetus is RH positive, then at the time of the delivery, some of the fetal RH positive blood can enter the mother's bloodstream and that would cause her to have an exposure to RH positive blood. So the response to that is she's going to generate anti-D antibodies. So that she's gonna create antibodies that can bind and cause agglutination against the RH factor. Okay, so that process in itself is kind of harmless right then because that baby's already sort of been delivered and nothing's gonna happen. But if the mother conceives a second RH positive child, now the mother has antibodies in her system that can cross through the placenta and attack the baby's RH factor. And so it's gonna attack the baby's red blood cells. Um, so for this reason, RH mothers are given a drug called Rogan during weeks 28 through 32 of pregnancy to prevent her from making those anti-D antibodies. So, uh, so here's the first baby, it's RH positive. Um, during delivery, some of that blood uh, might get into the mother and then she would create these antibodies. Again, that baby's fine because it just got delivered, but if a second RH positive baby comes along, those antibodies will go through the placenta and attack the fetal red blood cells. So we don't want that. So that's where the Rogan shot comes in to basically prevent this step. It would prevent 
the mother from ever making those uh, antibodies against the Rh factor. Okay, so who is the universal donor that individuals with type O negative blood? So why would that be? Because let's say we're in the emergency room and somebody is crashing fast and they've got to get blood and we don't have a lot of type for blood typing and um, we need to just be able to grab something and go. Well, think about the characteristics of type O negative blood. Do they have surface antigen A? No. Do they have surface antigen B? No. And we know that because they're type O. Type O doesn't have any A or B antigen. Do they have the RH factor? Nope. And we know that because of the negative. So O negative blood has absolutely nothing on the cell surface. And why is that important? That's important because if we're talking about the guy who's crashing, it doesn't matter what antibodies he has. In his system. It doesn't matter what blood type he has or what antibodies he has, there's nothing on the surface of O negative blood to get attacked. There's no surface antigens there. So it doesn't matter what kind of antibodies the recipient has, there's nothing to attack. So agglutination will not happen with O negative blood. Okay, who is the universal acceptor? AB positive. So let's think about that. So think about Really, you got to think about donor and acceptor. When If somebody's talking about the donor, you're talking about the person who's giving the blood. If you're talking about the acceptor, you're talking about the person receiving the blood. Okay, and um, so AB positive is universal acceptor. Why? Because since they have A and B and the RH factor because of the positive, they have all of the surface antigens on their uh, red blood cells. So what does that mean for antibodies? Because we make antibodies against the antigens we don't have. Well, they have all the antigens. That means that they don't have any of the antibodies. So it can take any type of blood, and there's no antibodies in their system to attack it. Does that make sense? Um, so this kind of shows you uh, blood type compatibility charts. The way I would do this is not memorize, certainly. I would really go with understanding the concept. Be able to take some questions onto, you know, can so-and-so donate to so-and-so? Can this type donate to this type? Think through the process. Write it down. Ask yourself, okay, here's this blood type. Which antigens do they have? Which antibodies do they have? Okay, so here's this person's blood type. Which antigens do they have? Which antibodies do they have? If you're talking about the recipient, you need to be thinking about the antibodies. You need to be thinking about what antigens are on the donor and what antibodies are in the recipient. And when those two interact, is there going to be a clash? So think about the concept and like line it all out like that. Who has what antigens? Who has what antibodies? And then determine whether you think they're compatible and then use this to check yourself. I think that's going to be far more effective than going and trying to memorize a chart like this. It's going to be important to understand the concept of who's got which antigens, who has which antibodies, and if one donates to the other, will an interaction occur? And then check yourself. And I'll also try to find some, maybe some videos uh, that kind of help reinforce this. Now your leukocytes, these are your white blood cells. These are the cells that help our body defend itself against pathogens, which are viruses, bacteria, cancer cells, anything that's not really supposed to be in our body. It's considered pathogen, something that causes diseases, and our leukocytes help protect us against those. So these are different from the erythrocytes of the red blood cells because it's not actually a formed element, it's an actual cell. So it has the nucleus and it has all of the organelles um, so it's a fully functional cell that can continue on for a while. Um, these typically reside in our tissue as opposed to the bloodstream. They enter the tissue through a process called diapedesis. It's a fancy term. It just means um, that the cell slips through the endothelial wall. So again, the endothelial cells are the cells that line the blood vessels. So here's a blood vessel right here. 
This is an endothelial cell. Here's another one. Here's another one. And you can see this leukocyte just kind of slipping through. So in here would be the tissue space. So the slipping through is called diapedesis. Um, they get attracted to uh, tissue injury sites by a process called chemotaxis. So what that means is, let's say somebody scraped their knee, and so the skin is open and bacteria gets in. So this tissue space is infected. So you would need leukocytes to come in here and kind of take care of some of these pathogens, these bacteria. So chemotaxis is a process where there's chemical signals released from this infected area and the leukocytes respond to those chemicals that get released. It's kind of an attraction. They get released and then um, that's detected by the leukocytes and so then they start to come near to that site. They'll go through diapedesis where they exit the blood and get into the tissue space. Um, leukocytes are either classified as one of two different broad types, either granulocytes or agranulocytes. Granulocytes have granules within the cell that are visible through the light microscope. So if you're looking at this particular type of cell through the light microscope, you see these little granules in the cell. Agranulocytes still have the granules, but the granules are so small they're not visible through the light microscope, so it looks like they don't have them. So for our granulocytes, we have three different types. We have neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils. And for our agranulocytes, we have lymphocytes, and monocytes. So here's a look at those. So these three on the top are, are granulocytes. This is a neutrophil, eosinophil, and a basis, basophil. They are agranulocytes down here, a lymphocyte, and a monocyte. So all of these cells are leukocytes. Um, our leukocytes are broken down into granulocytes and agranulocytes. And then our granulocytes, we have one, two, three different types. Agranulocytes, we have two different types. So all of the cells have a slightly different function. They kind of specialize in one area or another. And you can see they all have a slightly different appearance to them. Um, so you will want to be able to look at these um, kind of microscopic images and tell me what kind of leukocyte it is. Uh, so you should be able to tell me in a broad sense, this is a leukocyte. If I asked you, is it a leukocyte or is it an erythrocyte or is it a platelet? You would need to be able to tell me it was a leukocyte. But I could also ask, you know, is it a basophil or a neutrophil? So the neutrophils have the very light staining granules um, and then this multi-lobed nucleus. So all the dark purple is the nucleus here. Um, eosinophil has a slightly darker staining uh, granules and a bilobed nucleus where it looks like it just got pinched in the middle and you've got half over here and half over here. The basophil have the darker staining granules um, and they actually stain so dark that it's hard to actually distinguish where the nucleus is in there. Your lymphocyte has dark staining, or this is actually the nucleus not the the granules, um, but it stains so darkly it reminds me always of the basophil, except you have this kind of light halo area around it. Uh, and then the monocyte, monocyte always has this kind of C or U-shaped nucleus. Okay, let's look at the neutrophils first. So neutrophils are granulocytes. These are going to be the most numerous leukocyte in the blood. Characteristics, again, that multi-lobed nucleus. The cytoplasm uh, has those very pale colored granules. Uh, in terms of their function, when they enter the tissue space, they can phagocytize infectious pathogens. So phagocytosis, if you have forgotten, uh, is where it kind of just consumes or eats uh, the pathogen, almost like Pac-Man style. Um, so in that way, it can help to clear out some of the infectious agents. Um, neutrophil counts increase dramatically when a bacterial infection persists. So if you have a persistent bacterial infection, you're going to see higher than normal levels of neutrophils. Eosinophils make up about 1-4% to of leukocytes in the blood. These guys have that bilobed nucleus, so it looks like it got pinched in the middle and you've got half here and half here. They kind of have the medium staining granules. Um, 
that tend to be kind of a reddish color a little bit. So these guys phagocytize antigen antibody complexes and allergens. So an antigen antibody complex, if we have some kind of, uh, say, pathogen in our blood, and we happen to have an antibody against it, the antibody will bind to the pathogen. Now what that does is it makes the pathogen uh, not able to be harmful. It kind of neutralizes it. Um, so the pathogen can no longer hurt you, but now you have this big bulky complex of an antigen or a pathogen and uh, an antibody attached to it. So the eosinophils can come in and phagocytize that whole complex. So the antibody actually kind of neutralized the bad guy. Um, but the eosinophil came in and phagocytized that whole complex. And then it can also phagocytize allergens, which are anything that cause allergy-like symptoms. One of the other things eosinophils are known for is uh, their effects on parasitic worms. Um, so they release chemicals, and those chemicals uh, are destructive to parasitic worms, such as like a tapeworm or something. Basophils, um, these make up about half to 1% of the leukocytes in the blood. Their characteristics are the bilobed nucleus, but you can't really see the nucleus because the granules stain so darkly. So these have a, like a more blue purplish colored granules and they kind of mask that bilobed nucleus. One of the important things about basophils is that they contain and they release two molecules, histamine and heparin. So Here's a little bit about those two molecules. Histamine increases blood vessel diameter, so it causes vasodilation, or the widening of our blood vessels. It increases capillary permeability, which means uh, when the capillary permeability increases, that basically means that fluid that would normally be held within the blood vessel and restricted to within the blood vessel um, is now allowed to leak out of the blood vessel, and it kind of creeps into the tissue space, so you can get a lot of swelling and edema whenever you have capillary permeability that's gone up because um, fluid is now leaking out of the blood vessels. Um, histamine is also responsible for your allergy symptoms. This is why we take an antihistamine to kind of block the effects of histamine when, whenever we have allergies. Heparin is an important molecule for blood clotting or anticoagulation. So both of these molecules are um, made and released from the basophils. Lymphocytes, so now we're moving on to our agranulocytes. Lymphocytes make up about 20 to 40 percent of leukocytes in the blood. Um, they reside in the lymphatic organs and structures, which we will get to that when we get to the lymphatic system here in a couple weeks. Um, they have a dark staining rounded nucleus, so it's a very large dark staining nucleus. Um, and this is the one I said always reminds me of a basophil with a halo around it. Um, uh, there's three categories of lymphocytes. We have T lymphocytes, which are responsible for sort of overall managing our immune response. B lymphocytes, which are responsible for producing antibodies. And NK cells, which stands for natural killer cells. And these attack our abnormal and or infected tissue. So those are our three different types of lymphocytes. And we'll talk about these in more detail when we get to the immune response. And our monocytes. Our monocytes are the other type of agranulocyte that we have. Makes up about 2 to 8% of leukocytes in the blood. These always have a C or U-shaped nucleus, depending on which way the cell is oriented. Uh, these guys can move into the tissue spaces and they transform into a different cell type a larger phagocytic cell called macrophages. So they start out as monocytes and then they diffuse out into the infected tissue space and they kind of change into this um, <clears throat> larger phagocytic cell called a macrophage where now it can phagocytize pathogens, cellular fragments, um, and any dead dying cells, any kind of debris in the infected tissue space that we need to clear out. The differential count, so the white blood cell differential count, measures each different type of leukocyte in the blood. So under normal physiological conditions, you should have uh, 4,500 to 11,000 cells per microliter of blood. That's just kind of the cell count. 
and then these should be the percentage of each type of leukocyte that you have. 50 to 70 percent should be neutrophils, 20 to 40 percent should be lymphocytes, 2 to 8 percent should be monocytes, 1 to 4 percent should be eosinophils, and less than 1 percent should be basophils. So in a healthy individual, this is what their differential cell count should look like. And again, it's just um, kind of a representation of how many um, leukocytes or, you know, what percentage of leukocytes are present in the blood. So if you have an abnormal leukocyte number, um, then that can be indicative that you've got some kind of pathological condition going on. There's some kind of illness or ailment, um, and you can spot that, you know, if some of these numbers are off. So let's look at some of the different changes that you can see in differential count. Leukopenia is when you have a reduced number of leukocytes. Um, so in, if, if this were a normal blood smear, you would expect to see um, a few more leukocytes in there. This is mostly red blood cells and you can see just a few of them. Um, so this is, shows you leukopenia because you've got a reduced number of leukocytes. Um, individuals with leukopenia would be at a higher risk of developing infection because they don't have as many uh, leukocytes and leukocytes as we know help prevent against infection. Leukocytosis on the other hand is an elevated leukocyte. This is what you would expect to see if somebody has been dealing with a recent infection. So we've got a lot of leukocytes because they've been out and busy trying to fight the infection. Neutrophilia is an increase in neutrophils. These are typically associated with bacterial infections, stress, and tissue necrosis, or when your tissue starts to die. So you can see all of these neutrophils there. Lymphocytosis is an increased number of lymphocytes. Uh, this can be caused by viral infections and chronic bacterial infections. And then you have these morphologic changes, meaning that the cells change the way it looks, its shape. So the morphologic changes happen that make the cytoplasm of the cell appear watery. So you can kind of see that here <clears throat> in lymphocytosis. Lymphocytopenia is a decreased lymphocyte count, and uh, this occurs a lot of times with HIV infections. So clinical view for leukemia. Leukemia is a malignancy or a cancer of the leukocyte forming cells. So what happens is you get this abnormal development and proliferation of the leukocytes in the bone marrow and in the circulation. So we're getting sort of this overabundance of leukocytes, um, which means then we end up with a decrease in erythrocytes and platelets. Because we're making so many white blood cells, we can't make enough red blood cells or platelets. So the decreased in erythrocytes and platelet number manifests as anemia and, bleeding, anemia and bleeding, which are generally the first signs of leukemia. Um, so anemia, because we're just not making enough red blood cells, um, so that, man, that causes anemia. And then the bleeding, because we're not making enough platelets. And those things are occurring because we're actually making too many leukocytes. So acute leukemia happens mostly in children and young adults. It progresses very rapidly, and death generally occurs within um, months of onset, symptoms onset. And then chronic leukemia happens mostly in middle age individual. It progresses a lot slowly, a lot more slowly, and people can survive more than a year from the onset of symptoms. Now, of course, there is some variation in all of this. Um, it's going to depend on uh, primarily on how quickly you're able to catch uh, the diagnosis. Okay, platelets or thrombocytes, these are just those cellular fragments. They're enclosed by a plasma membrane. These are formed elements because they do not have a nucleus. Again, it's just a cellular fragment, so it's not a true living cell. Very similar to the erythrocyte. Uh, so what other type of blood, quote unquote, cell is not actually a cell due to the lack of nucleus? That's your erythrocyte. So the three types of cells you have in your blood, and again, I'm using the word cell loosely, red blood cells, platelets, and white blood cells, or erythrocytes, 
thrombocytes, and leukocytes. Um, those, they all have you know, varying names. Um, of those, the erythrocytes and the thrombocytes, or the red blood cells and the platelets, are formed elements because they don't have a nucleus and they don't have all their organelles. The white blood cells or the leukocytes do. Okay, so back to platelets. They serve an important role in blood clotting. They circulate for about 8 to 10 days before they're broken down. And we keep about 30% of our total platelets stored in the spleen. Uh, this is kind of our emergency reserve. Thrombocytopenia is the term for an abnormally low platelet count. Hemostasis refers to the process of blood clotting that occurs whenever there's been an injury to the blood vessel. So if we have uh, an injury here to this blood vessel, obviously blood can escape. That's a bad thing. We need to keep our blood in our vessels. Um, so we go through the process of hemostasis to basically fix that injured tissue so that uh, we don't lose too much blood through the vessel. So there's three overlapping phases, meaning there's three phases, but it doesn't necessarily move from step one to step two to step three. Um, they all kind of overlap. It does happen in a chronological order, but the phases do overlap. So you've got vascular spasm, platelet plug formation, and then the coagulation phase. Okay, so for vascular spasm, um, that's the first thing that's going to happen in hemostasis, and essentially what's going to happen is the blood vessel is going to constrict. So by constricting, it limits the amount of blood that can leak from the blood vessel. The spasm will last for a few minutes while it's waiting for the platelets to arrive. So the platelets have to come to the scene of the vessel injury to, you know, start the process of clotting it. Um, so while we wait for those platelets to get there, the blood vessel will constrict vascular spasm, um, and that helps to just limit the amount of blood that can escape through the vessel. Platelet plug formation. So <clears throat> this is the second phase of hemostasis. So normally, in the absence of a blood vessel injury, so under normal circumstances, the endothelial wall is coated with a molecule known as prostacyclin. Prostacyclin prevents platelet activation. It's kind of like the platelet repellent. We don't want our platelets active unless we actually need them to do their job. Otherwise, they'll just be like coagulating and clotting things all over the place. So they're kind of inactive, and our prostacyclin is what keeps them inactive. Um, so once the vessel is injured, collagen fibers start to become exposed. The platelets sit down and adhere to those collagen fibers with something, with the assistance of something known as the von Willebrand factor. That's just a small plasma protein, but it helps those platelets sit down and adhere to the exposed collagen fiber. So here's our uh, injury to our blood vessel. These would be the exposed collagen fibers. Our platelets come down and sit and attach to those, attaching on both sides with the help of that Wal uh, von Willebrand factor. So then the platelets start to develop these long processes to better adhere to the surface. So once they attach, they start to extend uh, processes from their surface. And then eventually that kind of closes off the injured site. So eventually it will, they'll all kind of extend and kind of block this off. And at that point, the blood can no longer leak out of the vessel. So platelet activation, as the platelets undergo those morphological changes, which again is the development of those long processes, it starts to do something called degranulate or degranulation. And all that means is to release chemicals. So all of this is part of platelet activation. They start to, um, it, they're just these little cellular fragments, but once they bind to the collagen through the von Willebrand factor, this is when they start to activate and they extend these long processes. They start to release chemicals, <clears throat> and those chemicals help with the other phases of hemostasis. So degranulation chemical release causes, one, prolonged vascular spasm. So that, pro that vascular spasm that was the first step, it was only going to last for a little bit. But as the platelets arrive and they start to release their chemical, now um, it's going to cause that vascular spasm to last even longer. So serotonin and thromboxane A2 are the chemicals that will prolong that vascular spasm. So they're coming from the platelets. 
it causes the attraction of other platelets to the site. So it releases adenosine diphosphate, or ADP, and thromboxane A2, and that helps to recruit additional platelets so we don't run short. Stimulation of coagulation, it releases procoagulants that help the process of coagulation. And then blood vessel repair, it stimulates uh, the release of secretions or substances that help to promote tissue growth and repair. So we have different coagulation pathways. We have an intrinsic pathway, which happens when the damage was initiated um, on the inside of the vessel wall. It's started by platelets, and it usually takes about three to six minutes for the intrinsic pathway. For the extrinsic pathway, it's initiated by damage outside of the vessel wall and usually takes about 15 seconds. Substances involved in coagulation. Um, so coagulation is a really long, complex process, and I'm not really going into uh, the entire process. So I'm just kind of hitting some highlights, knowing that there's an intrinsic and an extrinsic pathway and just those key features that I listed on the above slide. Um, and then these are just some of the factors that um, are substances that are important and involved in coagulation. So calcium is important. You have various clotting factors. Clotting factors are inactive enzymes that are produced by the liver. They become active when you go through the coagulation process. Platelets, of course, and then vitamin K. Vitamin K is fat-soluble vitamin required for the synthesis of clotting factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Um, so again, don't really worry about um, the significance of those numbers. There's a variety of clotting factors that um, we're not really going into detail with. But um, vitamin K is essential for the synthesis and production of, you know, these, a variety of them. So blood clotting disorders. Uh, hemophilia is caused by a genetic mutation, which, uh, so it's X-linked, meaning it's linked to the X chromosome. Um, and typically X-linked mutations are uh, mostly primarily manifest in men. Um, so it's genetic mutations and clotting factors which result in incomplete hemostasis and therefore uncontrolled bleeding. So hemophilia A is known as classic hemophilia. This is a deficiency in the normal factor eight. So again, one of those clotting factors it occurs in one in 5,000 males in the United States. And then you've got hemophilia B, which is a deficiency in a different factor. So uh, this is factor nine that's deficient and occurs in one in 25,000 males in the US. Just a side note down here, many drugs, so aspirin, ibuprofen, warfarin, herbal supplements, they can interfere with blood clotting. Um, so a lot of people don't think of that, uh, you know, when the, your doctor asks you what medications you're taking and you're like, oh, you know, Advil's over the counter, it doesn't matter. But a lot of these drugs uh, can impact blood clotting. So it's important to, you know, acknowledge that and think about that and let, you know, clinicians know that if you're taking them. Blood clotting disorder, disorders hypercoagulation. So hypercoagulation refers to an increased tendency of the blood to clot. So it's clotting when we don't necessarily need it to. There's not a tissue injury that needs to be uh, you know, clotted back together. Um, so hypercoagulation can lead to what's called a thrombus. A thrombus is a clot within a blood vessel. If the thrombus dislodges and travels throughout the blood, now it's called an embolus. So as long as it's kind of stationary, attached to the wall of the vessel, it's a thrombus. But, you know, the blood is constantly moving through these vessels and the force of the movement, it's like a, you know, a river, uh, it can dislodge that thrombus and now you've got a clot circulating throughout your bloodstream at which point it's, it's called an embolus. So emboli are very dangerous. If it travels to the lungs, it can obstruct the blood flow and it's called a pulmonary embolism and that can be fatal. If, if you don't get to it quickly. Um, also, if it travels to the brain, it can result in a stroke. So you basically have this clot that's now traveling through the bloodstream, and if it gets stuck in a vessel, nothing can pass beyond it. It's like a roadblock. And then you get um, tissue, you know, at the opposite end of that that is not getting blood distribution, blood distribution that can um, 
definitely be fatal if you're talking about your lung tissue or your brain tissue. The last slide for this chapter has to do with sympathetic response to blood loss. So whenever we sustain an injury and we start to lose blood, as we lose that blood, our blood pressure is going to decrease or go down. At more than 10% blood loss, uh, it, it results in a sufficient drop in blood pressure to cause a sympathetic response. So our fight or flight response becomes activated. That's part of our autonomic nervous system. So as part of that fight or flight activation, some of the following things are gonna occur. You're gonna get vasoconstriction. That's going to kind of reduce the diameter of our blood vessels. That's one of our body's quickest way to try to get our blood pressure back up. We have to sustain a certain blood pressure and able to be able to perfuse our blood to all of our tissues. So if it goes down, a very rapid, quick way to get it back up is to vasoconstrict. Uh, we're gonna increase our heart rate, and we're gonna increase the contractile force of the heart. So our heart is gonna beat stronger and faster, again, as a way to continue to pump blood throughout the body despite the blood loss. Our blood also gets redistributed to the brain and the heart. So our body kind of knows those are two of the most important organs. Um, so we're going to uh, promote the blood distribution primarily to those two organs, sort of at the expense of the other. It kind of recognizes that we're in an emergency situation. Um, and so we're going to vasoconstrict to try to increase our blood pressure, increase the heart rate, increase the heart force. And then if, if we still need to, then we'll redistribute the blood to the brain and the heart. So the goal of all of that is to make, try to maintain a blood pressure at a level that is able to sustain life. Now, once 40% of the blood is lost, the blood pressure is going to decrease to a, label, a level that we're unable to support life. So that would, that would be a fatal response at that point.